afternoon, y'all. My name is Mary, Mary Fields. But most folks call me Stagecoach Mary. On account, I'll be a reliable stagecoach mail deliverer. But I didn't always deliver the mail. No. Let me tell you about myself. You don't mind if we talk, do you? Good. I was born a slave in 1832 in Hickman County, Tennessee, on the plantation of Judge Edmund Dunn. And my mama, Susanna, she was the personal servant to the plantation's owner's wife, Miss Josephine Dunn. And my daddy, Buck, he worked in the fields on the Dunn farm. Now, when I was born, Buck was sold. But my mama didn't want me to go without a last name. And since my daddy worked in the fields, she decided my last name would be Fields. Now, about two weeks after I was born, Miss Dunn gave birth to a baby girl named Dolly. Now, you might think this wrong. But Dolly and me played together. That's right. And Mistress Dunn, she allowed me to learn to read and to write, too. <laughs> mm-hmm. You could say that Dolly and me got to be real good friends until she went off to boarding school in Ohio. It sucks. <laughs> now, about the age of 30, I got word from my dear friend Dolly, who was now a nun and renamed Amadeus. Well, the sister asked me to join her at the Ursuline Convent in Toledo, Ohio. I started quickly on my 29 day trip from Tennessee to Ohio. Mm hmm. So, did I stayed there a long time? Yeah. Even after Dolly, I mean the sister, left to go open a school for girls at the St. Peter's Mission in Montana, west of Cascade. Now, the nuns had become my family. See, I never married or had any children. But don't you know, word got to me that my dear friend, now Mother Amadeus, had taken ill with pneumonia and needed my help. Uh, I wasted no time leaving on the stagecoach and soon found out how rustic and remote Montana was. Mm. I was 53 years old, starting a new life in Montana and helping Mother Amadeus back to health. During those days, I had no trouble rolling my own cigars, shooting my guns, and drinking me some whiskey. Mm hmm. Hmm. You know, the Native Americans in Montana called me White Crow because I acted like a white woman with black skin. <laughs> and at the tender age of 63, Word got to me that Wells Fargo had a mail contract and they was looking for drivers to deliver the U.S. mail. Now, I cannot lie. I was hired because I was the fastest person to hook up a team of six horses, even faster than some men younger than me. <laughs> What's up? Oh, and I was the first African-American in the U.S. to deliver mail and the second woman in the world. I am proud to say 
that my stage coach was never held up. And me and my mule Moses and my horses never missed a day of delivering the U.S. mail. <laughs> oh, I'm just rambling on about myself. I told y'all that we would come and meet some other African-American women who were first at what they did. Now, they've been waiting for us, and we here. So come on in and meet them. Let's go now. Bye, Mary. Good afternoon. Welcome. Would you like some tea? Well, I was one of two children born to a Native American mother from the Mississauga Ajebawa tribe. And my father, African Haitian, was a gentleman's servant. I am Edmonia Lewis, born July 4, 1844, in Greenbush, New York. I was known as Wildfire, and my brother Samuel was called Sunrise. Now Sunrise, who is much older than me, had become a successful businessman and gold prospector. He paid my tuition to New York Central College. He had to transfer me to Oberlin College, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio. I eventually moved to Boston, where I studied under the well-known sculptor, Edward Augustus Brackett. Under his tutelage, I crafted my own sculpting tool and sold my first piece of sculpture for $8. I soon opened a studio to the public. My first bust was of Colonel Robert Goulshaw a white Bostonian who led black troops in the Civil War. I sold many copies of the bust and was able to move to Rome. Well, while in Rome, I became part of a large artistic community, which included other women sculptors. When I started to sculpt in marble, my sculptures took on a neoclassical style. My surroundings was of great influence and inspiration. Some of my works are Hagar in the Wilderness. I was inspired by the Egyptian handmaiden from the Bible's Old Testament. I used her to represent the African mothers in the United States. She symbolizes the abuse of women. Then there's the old arrow maker and his daughter. Those inspirations came from my own Native American heritage and the clothes used on the characters are of Native American descent, as well as the facial features are Native American traits. Then there's the death of Cleopatra, a 3,000 pound marble sculpture of the Egyptian queen in the throes of death. Many of my pieces are displayed in museums throughout the world, but much of my work was lost. After leaving Rome, 
I spent most of my time in the Hammersmith area of London. Bye, Monia. Hello. My name is Margaret Mary Washington. I was born in Macon, Mississippi on March 9th, 1861 to a sharecropper father of Irish descent and to whose name I never knew. But he died when I was seven years old. And my mother, Lucy, was an African-American washerwoman who had nine children. Although I was close to my mother and my siblings, I moved in with a brother and sister named Sanders. And they acted as my adoptive or foster parents. See, as a child, I spent most of my time reading, and I excelled in school. Now, the Sanders, they guided me towards a career in teaching. I got to the age of 14, and I was so good in school and so advanced that the school offered me a teaching position. Up until then, I had no formal training. But by the age of 19, I enrolled in the Fisk Preparatory School in Nashville, Tennessee. Because I worked part-time and trained part-time, I completed the prep course in five years and graduated from the university with honors in four years. And one of my classmates and lifelong friend was W.E.B. Du Bois. Due to my performance at Fisk University, I was offered a job at a Texas college. Instead, I took a position at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. The offer of this position not only came from a man that I met during my years at Fisk and who regarded me as a model student, but from the man I would later marry, Booker T. Washington, the founder of Tuskegee. Now, once I had accepted and taken on the position of lady principal, formerly held by Washington's deceased second wife, he proposed the following year. I must say, I did have feelings for Washington, but I was a little reluctant to marry him when he asked me. Booker had a brother, well, which he was especially close to, that, well, um, let's say we didn't see eye to eye. And this brother's wife was made to care for Booker's children after he was widowed. And the oldest daughter, Portia, well, she was just downright hostile to anyone she thought was taking her mother's place. And that included me taking on the position of lady principal. Well, we got married eventually on October 10, 1892. At Tuskegee, I not only served as lady principal, 
will charge over the female students. I founded the Women's Industries Division and taught domestic arts, through which schools in the country were found teaching women how to live and attend their homes. I was also part of Tuskegee's executive board and was acting head of the school when my husband was traveling. I helped form the National Association of Colored Women. Where lifting as we climb became our motto. Now, after my husband's death in 1915, I remained at the Oaks, our family homestead in Alabama. I was long considered the first lady of Tuskegee. Bye, Margaret. Good afternoon. I was born Sarah Breedlove, and I came into this world two days before Christmas on December 23rd, 1867, in Delta, Louisiana. I was one of six children. I had one sister, Lavinia, and four brothers, Alexander, James, Solomon and Owen Jr. My parents, Owen and Minerva, and elder siblings were slaves in the Mission Parish Plantation owned by Robert W. Boyden. I was the first child in my family born into freedom after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. My mother and father died when I was seven. I moved in with my older sister and brother-in-law. I was married by the age of 14 to Moses McWilliams so I could escape my brother-in-law's harassment. I was headed to St. Louis where three of my brothers lived. My brothers were barbers at the local barbershop. Like many of the women of my era, I started to experience hair loss, almost going bald, primarily because of our poor diet and harsh products like the lye that was in the soaps we used to cleanse our hair. And most of us lacked indoor plumbing, indoor heating, and electricity, so we bathed and washed our hair infrequently. Since I was learning about hair care from my brothers, I began to experiment with ointments and medical agents and shampoos to restore my hair. And the formula for scalp treatment came to me in a dream. I moved to Denver. And that's where I met and married Charles Joseph Walker. He was a newspaper advertising salesman. That's when I adopted the name you know me as, Madam C.J. Walker, and soon became an independent hairdresser and retailer of cosmetic creams. Charles started giving me advice on advertising and promotional skills. So that's when I began to train women to become beauty culturists and learn the art of selling. Some white newspapers started calling me the D. Kink Queen. Mm. Let me correct that once again. I have always considered myself to be a hair culturist. I grow hair. And while I'm making corrections, I never invented the straightening comb. Mm -mm. In fact, that metal comb had been sold before I was born. And in 1908, I temporarily moved my basis of operations to Pittsburgh. 
I settled in Indianapolis for a while where I built a factory, a hair manicure salon, and another training school. I later added the laboratory to help in the research. I had a thriving, thriving mail order business run by my daughter, Layla Walker. Within a few years, I moved to New York and left the day-to-day -day operations of my factory to my factory forelady and former school teacher. As I began to teach and train other black women in Harlem on how to build their businesses, I quickly became involved in the Harlem social and political life. Now at my convention, I not only rewarded my agents for their business success, but I also encouraged them to become politically active. One of the last messages I gave was this is the greatest country under the sun. At the time of my death on May 25th, 1919, I was considered the first African-American Millionaires. Au revoir, Madam C.J. Walker. Hello. My name is Bessie Coleman, and I was born in Atlanta, Texas, on January 26, 1892. I was the 10th child of 13 children by Susan and George Coleman. George, my father, who was part Cherokee, and my mother, Suzanne, were both sharecroppers. When I was around the age of two, my family moved to Waxachen, Texas, and I started school there at the age of six years old. I had to walk four miles each day to the segregated one-room school where I loved to read and found out that I was an outstanding math student. I was nine years old when my life took a dramatic turn. Oh, my father, being of Native American, descent, left our family and moved to Indian Territory in Oklahoma, where he had rights and better opportunities. My mother, she refused to go with him and stayed supporting herself and the five children still at home, including me the best way she could by picking cotton and taking in laundry. My mother, she encouraged my education. Even though she was at illiterate herself. At the age of 23, I moved to Chicago, Illinois, where I lived with my brothers went to beauty school, and became a manicurist. While working in the White House barber shop, I would hear stories from pilots returning from World War I about flying during the war. And I would read about the new field of aviation. And what heightened my interest is when my brothers would regale me with tales of French women flying planes in the World War I. So I enrolled in aviation school, but was turned down because I was black and a woman. Not even the black U.S. aviators would train me through that job as a manicurist, I was introduced 
to Robert S. Abbott, the publisher of the Chicago Defender. He encouraged me to go to France and study flying there. I took his advice. I got a new job managing a restaurant while studying French at the Berlin School. With funds from Abbott and a banker named Jesse Binga, I traveled to Paris. On November 20th, 1920, I was accepted into flying school. Seven months later, June 15, 1921, I became not only the first African-American woman to earn an international aviation license from the Federation Aeronautics International and the first American of any gender or ethnicity to do so. But also, I was the first African-American woman to earn aviation pilot license. I still wanted to polish my skills, so I spent two more months taking lessons from a French pilot and returned to New York in September of 1921. There, I was celebrated in the black press and ignored in the mainstream press because I wanted to make a living as a civilian aviator. I went back to Europe for advanced training in aerobatic flying and stunt flying. I returned once again to the United States with new confidence and enthusiasm to launch my career in exhibition flying. I became known as Queen Bess, the world's greatest woman flyer. I made my first appearance in an American air show on a Labor Day weekend, September 3rd, 1922, on Long Island, New York. The event was held in the honor of black veterans of World War I. Weeks later, I flew in a show in Chicago and became popular at the air shows. I wanted to start a flying school for African Americans and began recruiting students for the future venture. I opened a beauty shop in Florida to help raise funds and lectured at schools and churches. In 1923, I bought my own plane, a World War I surplus army training plane. Days later, I took a nosedive and crashed. The recuperation was long from all the bones I had broken, but I was determined and struggled to find new backers and new bookings for my stunt flying. The following year, the age of 34, I purchased my last plane. I never married or had children, but left a legacy of inspiration for generations to come of African-American men and women. So long, Bessie. Good afternoon. Everyone, I am Regina Anderson born in Chicago on May 21st, 1901, to William Grant Habeas Corpus Anderson. 
and Margaret Simmons Anderson Moore. My heritage is of multiracial descent, which includes Native American, Jewish, East Indian, Swedish, and other European ancestry. One of my grandparents was a Confederate general and one grandparent was of African descent, born in Madagascar. I studied at the University of Chicago and Wilberforce University in Ohio. I received my master's of library science from Columbia University. In my role, as a professional librarian for the 135th Street branch of the New York Public Library, and as an individual, I sponsored and promoted many artists and projects in the movement known as the Harlem Renaissance. During that time, I shared with two other women an apartment in the Sugar Hill District of Harlem at 580 St. Nicholas Avenue. Our apartment became known as the 580 and the Harlem West Side Literary Salon. We made it available space to the community for hosting salons, events, and gatherings for artists and intellectuals. Now, on March 21st, 1924, we organized the Civil Club Dinner for New York writers. This dinner was attended by 110 guests, including W.E.B. Du Bois, Gene Toomer, County Cullen, and Langston Hughes. This was known as one of the coalescing events of the Harlem Renaissance. I founded, with the help of W.E. Du Bois, Cregua Players, later known as the Experimental Theater, which was located in the basement of the library in Harlem. I wrote seven plays under the pseudonym Ursula Trelling. The players produced my plays. One was Climbing Jacob's Ladder, about lynching. Another called Underground, about the Underground Railroad. The Man Who Passed, about passing. Most of my works and contributions were recognized at the 1939 World's Fair in New York. I married William Trent Andrews, a lawyer and New York State Assemblyman. We had one daughter, Regina Ann Anderson Batiste. I was the first minority to climb the ranks and eventually become a supervising librarian at the New York Public Library. I overcame struggles to break the color barrier. And as I look at the progress of African Americans in the arts, it gives me a great deal of personal satisfaction to have lived to see much of what we work to achieve become a reality. We do need more and more opportunities for our artists, actors, writers, and directors. Greetings, America. I am Kamala Davi Harris Imhoff, the first African and Asian American vice president elected in US history. I was born in Oakland, California to my Jamaican American father Donald J. Harris, and my Indian mother, 
Shamala Gopalan Harris. I grew up with my youngest sister, Maya Harris, in West Berkeley, California, in an area often called the Flatlands, known for its significant Black population. I have spent the better part of two decades in public life creating a long list of things I was the first to achieve. This gives credence to my motto, which comes from my mother. You may be the first, but make sure you're not the last. I was strongly influenced by my maternal grandfather, P.V. Goplin, who was a retired Indian civil servant and his progressive views on democracy and women's rights impressed me. As a young girl, I often accompanied my parents to civil rights marches. I went to so many, in fact, that my mother asked me what I wanted, and out of frustration, I said, freedom. It has been my long fostered belief in freedom and justice for all people that has shaped me into who I am today. My parents divorced when I was seven, but my mother understood that she was raising two black daughters and she was determined to make sure we would grow into confident, proud black women. After high school, I attended Howard University, a historically black university. While there, I interned as a mail clerk for California Senator, joined Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, chaired the Economics Society, and led the debate team. I returned to California, attended law school, and graduated with a Juris Doctor. When I became a Deputy District Attorney, I quickly established myself as an innovative change agent in American law enforcement. Smart on crime became my mantra. Being smart means learning the truths that can make us better as a community and supporting those truths. One of my signature accomplishments as Attorney General was creating Open Justice, an online platform to make criminal justice data available to the public. This database helps improve police accountability by collecting info on the number of deaths and injuries of those in police custody. Through the arcs of my own life, I have spoken about the work women have done and continue to do in the United States. As my mother reminded me, when she came here from India at the age of 19, how she believed deeply in the American country of possibilities. My husband, Doug Imhoff, since 2014, hit the ground running with our dating, thinking as two lawyers would. I know my husband probably never thought he would be on this public a stage but he has been preparing for a White House role that has been occupied only by women. Although he will be the country's first second gentleman, I will still call him honey. On social media, he is all too happy to share his feelings of love and pride for me. And his fans refer to themselves as Doug High, and my supporters refer to themselves as K High. 
a play on Beyonce's Bay High. My stepchildren call me Mamala. I love to cook and I collect Converse Chuck Taylor sneakers, which are my go-to travel shoes. Some of my favorite books include Native Son, The Kite Runner, and Song of Solomon. And I would like to share an excerpt from my own book, The Truths We Hold. Here we go. I was no longer a candidate for office. I was a U.S. Senator-elect, the first black woman from my state and the second in the nation's history to earn that job. It was and is a humbling and extraordinary honor. We are better than this. Americans know we're better than this, but we're going to have to improve it. We're going to have to fight for it. On July 4th, 1992, one of my heroes and inspirations, Thurgood Marshall, gave a speech that deeply resonates today. We cannot play ostrich, he said. Democracy just cannot flourish amid fear. Liberty cannot bloom amid hate. Justice cannot take root amid rage. America must get to work. We must dissent from the indifference. We must dissent from the apathy. We must dissent from the fear, the hatred, and the mistrust. We cannot build an economy that gives dignity and decency to American workers unless we first speak truth, that we are asking people to do more with less money and to live longer with less security. Wages haven't risen in 40 years, even as a cost of healthcare, tuition, and housing have soared. The middle class is living paycheck to paycheck. We must speak truth about our mass incarceration crisis, that we put more people in prison than any country on earth for no good reason. We must speak truth about police brutality, about racial bias, about the killing of unarmed black men. We must speak truth about pharmaceutical companies that push addictive opioids on unsuspecting communities and payday lenders and for-profit colleges that have leached on the vulnerable Americans and overloaded them with debt. We must speak truth about greedy, predatory corporations that have turned deregulation financial speculation, and climate denialism in degree. And I intend to do just that. First, my name is pronounced Kamala, like the punctuation mark. It means lotus flower, which is a symbol of significance in Indian culture. A lotus grows underwater its flower rising above the surface while its roots are planted firmly in the riverbed. I want you to know how personal this is for me. This is the story of my family. It is the story of my childhood. It is the story of the life I have built since then. You'll meet my family and my friends, my colleagues and my team. I hope you will cherish them as I do. And through my telling, see that nothing I have ever accomplished could have been done on my own. Thank you and very much for spending the afternoon with me 
and the fabulous women of FIRST.